Good morning. Thank you all for being here. I am so excited for you. Um, we have a great presentation today. I have told some of you <laughs> that if you don't learn something today, check in with me at the end and I will eat my shoe. I promise you are going to learn things today um, and Kate has put an amazing amount of time, energy, and years of education into what is she is going to be presenting to you. Um, I asked her, even though you know her face, you even saw her perhaps last month at our um, first reconciliation meeting, she has an incredible background that you all need to know why she would be an authority in this area. So. Kate Bazine, your presenter today, serves as our pastoral associate of evangelization. She helps mentor parishioners in intentional discipleship, works with the parents in our Faith Journeys program, and helps with First Reconciliation and First Communion preparation. Kate comes to us with a unique academic background. She received her Bachelor's of Arts in Philosophy from the University of Dallas, where she was formed in St. Paul, St. John Paul II's philosophic thought known as Thomistic Personalism. She continued her studies at University of Mary, where she earned her master's degree and is now working on a doctorate in education and Catholic studies through the University of Mary. The University of Mary's Catholic Studies program forms students to take a rich, interdisciplinary approach as they seek to understand and confront the real challenges of the world through a holistic lens guided by the Catholic intellectual tradition. We're all trying to sit over here on this side. This is on purpose. <laughs> Today, Kate will share with us an overview of church history that will help provide a context and framework as we seek to guide our children to live a life with Christ, equipped to confront the challenges of our current age. Without further ado, I introduce to you Kate Bazine. Yay! Thank you, Kelly. Can you guys hear me okay? Okay, I'm kind of soft-spoken, so I have a mic. Hopefully that'll help. Um, let's start with prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Grant, O merciful God, that I may desire ardently, seek prudently, recognize truly, and complete perfectly all that is pleasing to thee. For the praise and glory of thy name, amen. In the name of Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. So as Kelly mentioned, today we're going to be talking about church history. I'm not going to be going through every council and every decision. Um, rather, I want to provide an overall framework of a pattern we see through the ages as the church encounters new peoples of different times, um, how the truth rises to the surface, and we're called as followers of Christ to live that in our current age. Um, 
And we're going to talk a little bit about what that looks like in our current age. So I want to give you guys a minute to turn to your neighbor or someone around you and talk about what is one tradition or practice that has helped you grow closer to Christ. It may be the rosary. It may be um, just something that helps you grow closer to Christ. And there may be one tradition or practice that you don't quite understand. So I'll give you guys a couple of minutes to do that with a neighbor. Okay, I hope you've all had a chance to at least think through the ways our practices and our traditions bring us closer to Christ. And also, it's okay that there's some that we may not understand or just we're still learning about. Um, we're going to next watch a quick video that kind of teases out what tradition is, what we mean when we say tradition. Because um, there's a few things to keep in mind as we dig in through church history. Um, as we follow through the ages, it's important to remember that there's different cultural expressions that we'll see in different ages of our church, um, but there's still truth, um, and that's one of the reasons why we say our church is ever ancient and ever new. So I'm going to show this quick video before we continue. Why are people fighting about tradition? During the last decades, Catholic life has been dominated by questions of tradition. What is it? How important is it? What's its role in the life of faith? These questions don't just occupy the minds of academic theologians, but have found their way into books and podcasts, blogs and dinner conversations. Individuals and entire communities have increasingly defined themselves based on their understanding of tradition. Much of the difficulty arises from the dynamic nature of the faith. Like the God it teaches about, Christianity understands itself as being ever ancient, ever new. While holding to ancient traditions and perennial truths, the church develops and adapts its cultural and devotional expressions to ensure that the unchanging gospel is preached as ever new to every generation. But here lies the difficulty. What can change and what cannot? First, this question. What is tradition? From the very beginning, Christians have held fast to the tradition that was handed to them by Christ through the apostles. Regarding this collection of truths as divinely revealed, Christians accepted them as being perennially true, that is, equally true to all peoples in all ages. These truths, referred to as capital T tradition, have been passed down for millennia, but Christians do not hold them due to their longevity Instead, it's precisely because these truths are perennially true that Christians have held to them from one generation to the next. Even just after the ascension, when the truths of faith didn't seem very old, they were already perennial. But not all traditions belong to this category. The church exists in time and space, and so some particular traditions devotional, spiritual, and disciplinary have arisen in each time and place, enlivening the practice and expression of the faith. The vast liturgical tapestry of the different rites of Catholic worship through the ages attests to this. These particular small T traditions can be retained, modified, or even abandoned as the church progresses through the ages to ensure that the faith can be presented and handed on anew in all its force and purity to every generation. 
However, while changeable, these small tea traditions are not merely a matter of preference or fad and should only be modified with reason and care. Their importance is found in their profound ability to manifest and articulate perennial truths in the clothing of a particular time and place. This, then, is what it means for Christianity to be ever ancient, ever new while handing down divinely inspired perennial truths from one generation to the next. These truths are incarnated and expressed within specific cultures and ages. There can be a tendency in two opposite directions as the church makes her way through time. In one direction is a progressivist tendency, wanting to change even that which is perennial dispatching with time-honored practices quickly or impatiently, all in an effort to achieve greater cultural relevance. In the other direction is a traditionalist tendency, which mistakes certain changeable expressions for perennial truths, not wanting anything to change, even at the cost of hanging on to cultural expressions of faith that may have lost their force or resonance. Both cases are marked by an error of judgment concerning what is perennial and what is not. <coughs> the Church, through the witness of the saints and the teaching magisterium, has been graced with the gift of discernment to hold fast to a perennial tradition while continuing the evangelical task of clothing the truth in ways that will win souls and transform human cultures. Rather than defining ourselves as progressivists or traditionalists, we seek a deeper identity, to be faithful Catholics, seeking, guarding, and handing on perennial truths. Great. So as we move through the ages, I want you to hold those two things in your mind. That there's going to be things that have always existed and always have been, and there's going to be ways the church grows and changes in new ages. Um, we're also going to see doctrine get further defined and clarified throughout the ages. And that only happens when questions rise to the surface, when there's conflict that rises to the surface. Um, so before we jump into 2,000 years of history, we need a framework. Um, we're going to be using a framework um, that was um, given to us by uh, Catholic intellectual known as Christopher Dawson. Um, he was a historian and sociologist. He crossed over into a lot of different fields. Um, he passed away just before Vatican II, um, but he wrote extensively on the history of the church from various different perspectives. And he identified six ages, um, which you'll see on your paper in front of you, and we're going to keep his framework as we move for forward. He also identified a pattern that occurred in each age. Each age, there was a crisis um, that brought about that new age. Um, and then there was a new apostolate. There was a way that uh, the church was bringing the truth into a new age in different ways. Um, there was also different achievements in each age, different forms of Christian art and thought. Um, and then in each age, we also see a retreat. We see ways the church is attacked, both from within, internal disputes, and from the outside. Um, so we'll be following this pattern throughout the six ages of the church. We also see another pattern emerge as early as Acts. If you read through the Acts in one sitting, you'll see two things happen when the apostles bring the truth of Christ to new peoples. And a lot of that depends on whether or not they choose to believe or they do not. So when they bring about the truth of Christ's message to new people, whether it's through healings or miracles or words, there's this moment of wonder. And that's universal. They're wondering, what is happening? Why did this person get healed? And then if they move from there into belief, you see they're filled with the Spirit. They're filled with wisdom. They're amazed, and they have a fear of God, a new desire to worship. If they respond in disbelief, you see confusion, fear of men, and anger. And that repeats in Acts, and then we'll see it repeat throughout history, too. All right, so before we jump in, I want to give you all a chance to think through what you remember from history. Dust off those cobwebs. So on the right side of your column, it's completely blank. I want you to just jot down anything you remember from each age. And you can work with the people around you. We might have some history buffs. You can find a ringer for your group. Um, but I'm going to give you guys five minutes 
to write down anything you remember from the last 2,000 years of history. <laughs> and just guess. You can put it in the right century, maybe. Guess, guess where it goes. <laughs> And I'll give you about one more minute to see what rises to the surface. Okay, and I promise there'll be no test. But how'd you do? How many of you had a lot more dates closer to our current age than the earlier date? Yeah? I think that's probably pretty natural. At least we tend to focus on history a lot of times after, you know, either 1400s or 1700s. We're going to go way back. Um, I'd like to go back even further, but that gets into salvation history, and that's a whole other presentation. <laughs> So we're going to start with our first age of the church, um, which begins with Christ. We have our first council already, and you can read about it in the Acts of the Apostles, the first council of Jerusalem in about year 49. Um, and we already see the apostles trying to figure out how to, um, what happens when they encounter new people. So they have Gentiles converting we have Jewish people following the Jewish rule, the Jewish custom, and they're discussing what do we do about this. Um, we have St. Peter already. He gets a vision. His, he's speaking with authority in this. Um, so we're starting to see what will lay the template for how the church deals with these. How do we encounter these new peoples? What's part of our doctrine? What's not? Um, already in the book of Art, Acts. In the year 64, Peter and Paul are martyred in St. Peter. So St. Peter is established as the See of Peter, the head of the church. Um, the DDK is the first written document we have that explains what catechesis should look like for new Christians. And that's dated somewhere around year 60 to 150. You can find translations of it online. It's a short document. It's kind of interesting to read what the early church thought new catechumens needed to be med, needed to um, learn. During this time, too, there were different waves of persecutions. Rome is the main secular authority. Um, there were periods where per persecution was kind of um, less intense, where Christians were starting to penetrate Roman society. Um, you can look back in early writings, and you have Christian uh, thinkers trying to figure out how do we educate Christians. There weren't Christian schools. The, um, you, we had some Christians in the Hellenistic schools. Um, there's old notebooks that have been found of boys who wrote crosses on the top of their notebooks. Um, they probably 
faced different levels of persecution in the schools. You know, uh, the rest of the culture had multiple gods. Christianity was this weird thing. And then for many sections of the stage, it was persecutable by death. So we have Christians round up and martyred. It took a lot of courage to live your faith in this age. Um, but you start getting um, a bunch of thinkers rise to the surface who are thinking through Christian concepts. Uh, many of them have been educated in Hellenistic schools with that Hellenistic uh, philosophic thought. So they have that framework, maybe Platonic ideas, to help provide structure to our understanding of revealed truth. Um, we see that with St. Paul in the letters to the epistles. He was both educated as a Jewish and he received this Roman um, education that had Hellenistic influences. So we start seeing the melding of these two cultures. Um, at the end of this age, uh, Emperor, the Emperor Constantine converts to Christianity in 312. That's a big moment in Christian history because suddenly it's okay to live your faith publicly. And this came after several waves of really intense persecution. Um, and then Christianity is now a public religion. At the very end of this, we see another major council, the Council of Nicaea, where Christian thinkers were trying to really sort out the nature of Christ. Was he man? Was he divine? Was he both man and divine? And of course we know he's man and divine, but there was a huge group of people following Arius who argued for his um, Christ being purely human. Um, now, the council overruled Arius. Arius was sent into exile into the Balkans, but he continued to teach, and Arianism continued to spread in the Near East and then what is now the Middle East. So keep that in mind, because that will come into play later. The second age of the church, we're going to start again with the internal disputes um, that we see in, rise to the surface in the Council of Nicaea. Um, Arianism is spreading in the East. There's a few councils between the Council of Nicaea and Council of Constantinople, but I'm trying to keep things brief. Um, Council of Constantinople, we get um, some more things fleshed out and added to our creed that we say every week in Mass. Um, they're also starting to get some clarification on the role of the papacy. Um, at this time, too, there are some differences between the Eastern Church and the Western Church. So the Eastern Church has their um, seat of power in Constantinople. Um, there's two major schools in Antioch and Alexandria, and there's a lot of great Christian writers um, in both of these centers of thought. Um, in Alexandria, that was the great school established by Alexander the Great after he conquered the Western world, and we have Christian thinkers now part of that school um, working through that philosophic thought. Um, as the Eastern Church and Western Church moves through history, uh, you'll see different cultural identities. The Eastern Church um, is using Greek as their main language. The Western Church is using Latin. The Eastern Church has a different conception of um, the papacy. So we start seeing ideas of Caesaropapism emerge, and that places the secular authority above the religious authority, oftentimes even in matters of um, religious issues, whereas in the Western Church, um, it, the authority is centered around the Pope in Rome, um, and that is separate from the secular power right now. Um, we also see the Roman Empire on the decline. The uh, Rome is sacked in 410. Barbarian tribes are moving in, um, but they're attracted to this now Roman thing that is Christianity. It has stability. Um, they're attracted to the ideals. And so we have the Frankish king, Clovis, converted in 496. And when he converts, the rest of his tribe converts to Christianity. And that will lay out the pattern for the spread of Christianity in these regions for the next two ages. Um, we have two key figures emerge at the end of this age. So first, St. Benedict of Nursia um, writes the first monastic rule for Western monasticism. It's short. It's really fun to read. There's a lot of beautiful truth in here. There's also some things that aren't lived anymore. Like, for instance, he talks about sleeping with a knife under your pillow. Um, I know some beautiful Benedictine sisters who live the rule very well, but they don't put knives under their pillows. So it just kind of shows you there's a lot of beautiful truth that we still live today in this that can be found in this, but there's also things that are particular to that age and time. Um, at the end of this age, um, in that region that was settled by 
Arius and Arianum is spreading. We see a young boy who um, is living a nomadic life with tribes. He marries a widow who has a big caravan um, and in his travels has an experience in a cave, um, writes that down, and that is where we get the Quran. Um, it has a different conception of Jesus Christ as a man. It's different from our Christian conception and then lots of other differences that we'll get into in a minute. So this age ends with Muhammad and Benedict. Um, we have lots of great figures that arose in this time. Um, St. Basil, St. Gregory, St. John Christendom, St. Augustine, St. Jerome are all figures of this time. They were sorting through what Christian education should look like. Um, they're all grappling with what our Christian children should learn. Uh, they have this rich Hellenistic tradition, poetry, novels, but they're also recognizing that there's things in that that are not in line with Christianity. So they're lifting up the virtue from the Greek thinkers. They're lifting up the methods of teaching through heroic deeds and words, but then they're melding that with Christian ideals. Um, St. Augustine gives us the famous phrase, plunder the Egyptians. So when you dig through these Hellenistic thinkers, take what's good, cast off what's bad. And that can set us a great template for today too, as we confront how to educate our children in the secular world. Look for what's good, cast off what's bad. Okay, third, the third age. I gotta take a sip of water really quick. I'm trying to get through this really fast. So this starts with the barbarians invading Rome. Rome is fallen. Um, it also starts with the spread of Muhammadism, which was known to the Christian world as a Christian heresy. It had branched off of Arianism. Um, but it's gathering force and coming in through Spain. Um, at this time, though, the French tribes unite and they hold off the Muslim invaders at the Battle of Tours in 732 that was led by Charles Martel. And then as a reward, his great-grandson Charlemagne was crowned as the first emperor um, by the, the Roman Pope. Um, we also start seeing Christianity spread through these monastic centers. So the Benedictine order is spreading throughout Europe. Um, they're creating these centers of learning, these centers of culture. The Benedictines have a, a way of life where they're adding prayer to their work and study. And each time they set up a new monastery, it just spreads that Christian way to that, that region and that area. Um, we start having Christianity spread to the Czechs, the Poles, the Mygars, the Russians, um, St. Cyril and St. Methodius. Um, are very influential in creating the language for Eastern Europe. Um, they give, bring these people not only Christianity, but lots of tools of the, what's now the Christian world um, in terms of writing and education. Uh, we have a common ecclesiastic culture that's rooted in Latin in the Western church, but again, we're starting to see these tensions between the Western and the Eastern church rise to the surface, particularly again around the culture, the language, the politics, um, the role of the Pope, um, and language around the Trinity, which I won't get into. So there's some other things um, that, that are dividing that gulf a little further. Um, also, remember Rome was sacked. So the Eastern Church argues that since Rome was sacked, Rome has fallen, the new seat of power is in Constantinople. So from a Byzantine Eastern Orthodox perspective, Constantinople is the new Rome. Um, Ro from a Western perspective, the Sea of Peter is Rome no matter what state Rome's in. Um, so that's where that split happens. The formal split between the Western and Eastern Orthodox Church happens in 1054. So at the end of this age, we have internal disputes between the East and West and the pressing in of the Muslim invasion. Okay, we're almost there at the fourth age. Um, So at this age, we again start seeing religious life spread. We see new monasteries spread. This is also the age of the Crusades. Now, the Crusades are kind of funny to look at. We won't go too deep into them. Uh, there's arguments to be made that there are lots of military failures involved with the Crusades, but it also united Europe. Um, it kept Muslim forces at bay. Um, and it's been called a spiritual phenomenon. Historian Henry Danielle Ropes said, 
The Crusades were a spiritual manifestation of that spiritual impulse springing from the depth of man's soul, the heroic expression of faith which founded no satisfaction unless in sacrifice, an answer to the call of God. So that, from a church perspective, that was what was driving the Crusades. You can make your own judgments about good, bad, the outcome of it. Um, but that was a huge driving force during this age. Um, we have another, a lot of great saints emerge from this age. A lot of mystic saints emerge. This is the age of St. Dominic. It's the age of St. Francis of Assisi, St. Catherine of Siena, St. Julian of Norwich. Um, but things also get a little sideways in this age within the church. And as Catholics, we want to look at our church history with eyes wide open, recognizing that we're called to live our faith in every age, knowing that there can be internal turmoil and exterior turmoil. So we have the Fourth Lateral Council, which gives us that clarification of transubstantiation. It creates new orders, and this is also where women's orders emerge. They're formalized. Um, women were informally meeting, but now we have formalized women's orders. This is also where our papacy, papacy splits. There was a period of time in church history where there was a pope in Rome and a pope in Avignon, and there was dispute over which was the true pope. To resolve that situation, another council was called in Pisa, but they just elected another pope. So we had three popes for a brief period. Um, that was another council was called to resolve that, the Council of Constantinople. And they did successfully resolve that, the pope issue, um, but it also stirred up some more trouble. Um, at this time during the Eastern Church, and remember this is a time full of very public corruption in the church. Uh, we have a charismatic priest, Jan Hus, really moving the hearts of the people, but also causing a lot, a big stir and revolution in Bohemia. He's brought into the Council of, uh, Constant of Constance and executed at that council. And that does not die there. It just causes more revolution in that region of the country, of the world. Um, Bohemia is declared a nation of heretics, and we start seeing the seeds of later religious war planted at that age. This age ends with the fall of Constantinople, which has a huge impact, ripple waves throughout the church. Remember, if you are Eastern Orthodox, you have argued that Constantinople is the new Rome because Rome fell. So what happens when Constantinople falls? Your seat of authority has fallen. The argument is, under theory of Caesaropapism, that the new seat of power moves to wherever the secular authority is. And so if you follow that through, um, there's arguments to be made that that is now Moscow, which has political implications for us in our current age. Um, when you're looking at the Eastern Orthodox Church and how that relates to um, secular authority. Finally, in the fifth age, we began with a lot of turmoil in the church. The Spanish Inquisition occurs in this age. Um, there's a need for reform. Now, in the early church, when we're starting to clarify doctrines, there were a few key characteristics we looked for to know if something was a true doctrine. We looked at whether or not the person proclaiming it was staying within the bounds of already established doctrine. Now, in early church, there was less boundaries than were defined later throughout the councils. We looked at the holiness of life of the person proclaiming the doctrine, and we looked at whether or not it went through this formal process. So remember, we were given a formal process in Acts, in the early church. We saw what that formal process looks like. So there are times in history when reformation is needed, but there's a process and a way for that to go about. Um, during this age, we see the need for reformation. There are issues that have just rippled through Europe. But then we also have a lot of figures rising to the surface, quickly taking that reformation into their own hands. So in 1517, Martin Luther posed his 95 theses. He saw himself as a reformer. We know that that's not how that played out in history. Um, other figures, Calvin um, and Zwigli, were of this age, and they were looking at the same things we see in other schisms. They were looking at um, how liturgy unfolds, what the focus is on, the role of the Eucharist, the role of scripture, what, it, what we mean by the fallen nature of man, how fallen are we, how redeemable are we. So these questions rise to the surface and they're 
sorted out in different ways. Um, but we also have a lot of great saints rise up in this age that show us how to live our Christian faith, even in periods of turmoil. Europe is at war at this age, lots of religious wars, especially in Eastern Europe. I got a sip of water. Philosophically, there is a move towards more individualism. The church has become very dependent on its secular authority, and there's people questioning that. They're rejecting that. So we see a rise in individualism. We see um, other philosophic turnings in this age that are going to move society in a different direction. This is the age of the American Revolution. It's the age of the French Revolution, and that will send shockwaves through Europe. Um, we also have, I'm going to pause here, we talked about St. Francis and St. Dominic rising in the past age. Um, they have two different orders and two different charisms. The Dominicans tended to be more intellectual. They would dissect knowledge um, at the order of the preachers. They would go and preach these, they still do, these wonderful homilies. Um, the Franciscans were very close to the earth. They lived their faith well, and they um, reached out to the people in their area. In this age, we have St. Ignatius rise. Um, he brings us the Jesuit way of life. The Jesuit life takes that monastic way of living and brings it into a life lived in the world. So in each age, as we have new challenges, we have new orders emerge that are able to cope with things in different ways and give us different patterns of life. All right, so surprisingly, we are now at the final age. Now part of this is because Christopher Dawson died right before Vatican II. So there might be arguments to be made that we've moved into another age. I am not going to be the person to make those arguments. I don't think enough time has passed for us to look at how that shifting occurs. But a lot has happened. We had the French Revolution, which was very bloody for the church. Monasteries were burned. Priests were killed. Um, we also, we didn't even talk about England. When Eng the Reformation happened in England, also very bloody. Monasteries burned. Priests round up. But we start seeing a revival. Um, we have the Oxford movement emerge in England. Um, a famous Anglican cardinal, Cardinal John Henry Newman, converts to Catholicism uh, and really brings a new intellectual rebirth of, of Catholicism in England. He wrote um, a brilliant work, Development of Doctrine, which really unfolds how doctrine develops over time and the difference between a development and a corruption. So if you want to dig more into that, I definitely recommend that. Um, we also start having the church really deal with things that rose to the surface during the Reformation. Um, liturgy, what that should look like. We get clear definition on the Pope and what it means when the Pope is speaking from the seat of infallibility. All of that gets defined in this age. Um, the church moves slowly. It tries to see through the lens of eternity. So Vatican I started in 1869. Vatican II was a continuation of that, and it ended in 1965. So when I hear people complain about how long it's taking the church to make a decision, it's 100 years to finish that council, and it's trying to see through the lens of eternity. So there's a reason why it's slow moving. Um, there were also a lot of wars that happened between those two councils. Um, so Vatican I, we start with looking at liturgical reforms. We get um, kind of distracted by the issue of infallibility, but that gets clearly defined. We also have, at this time, the rise of the Industrial Revolution. So we're starting to see um, consider workers' rights. Rerum Novarum comes out in 1891, which is a really beautiful um, emergence of Catholic social doctrine. It affirms workers' rights. It also condemns new ideologies spreading like Marxism, socialism, communism. It solidifies the family as the essential key unit of society and the, the beauty that that holds in that place. Um, it also affirms workers' rights in a beautiful way. So it's a beautiful document that emerges right at this time when those issues are coming to a surface. Um, Secular history, we have lots of revolution and war that unfolds over the next age. But we also have a lot of beautiful saints of this time. We talked about John Henry Newman. Our church's namesake, St. Elizabeth Ann Seton, is of this age. St. Edith Stein, a German Jewish philosopher who converts and becomes a Carmelite nun. Lots of beautiful writings, um, specifically the education. St. Jose Maria Escriva is working through what holiness looks like in lay life. 
and is lifting up the laity, um, St. Teresa of Lisieux, St. Maximilian Kolbe, and St. John Paul II. Um, we also see in America a beautiful template for how the church can thrive and flourish without that secular authority. So remember in Europe, the church has for much of the ages held some type of secular authority. Um, America it never had that. It was persecuted here from the beginning, but we still see Catholicism grow and develop in a beautiful way here. So it can provide a great template for how the church can grow and spread with unity. Um, are we in retreat? What is threatening the church now? Um, so we do have persecution in the East and Africa. There's philosophies such as materialism and relativism that infringe on our ideas that, um, that, that do cause battles. There's been a theological and um, philosophical split. Um, theology and philosophy have been separated for some time. Um, and then we still see liturgical battles today. So what does that mean for us in our, as Catholics in our current age um, as we see these things still emerging? Um, we've seen that the disputes are not new. They've always been there. There's always times when it's challenging to live our faith in the world. Um, but in all of these ages, when there's challenges, there's ordinary people living the faith well and spreading that light into the world. So we're going to watch a quick video on what it means to live the Catholic faith in ages of Christendom versus apostolic ages. And then we'll close with a few final thoughts. There are two basic modes by which the church engages the wider society in its mission to build the kingdom of God, an apostolic mode and a Christendom mode. A Christendom mode arises when the society's imaginative vision is Christian, and the church has succeeded in deeply influencing the society's narrative and institutions. An apostolic mode is needed when the society's imaginative vision is not Christian, and the faith thus often finds itself at odds with the prevailing culture. Different circumstances in society demand different strategies. In Christendom, the Church's task is centered on the complex work of maintaining and deepening the Christian vision in all aspects of life. The great advantage of such a time is that God's truth is readily available to all and Christ's presence influences the institutions and overall imagination of the society. But this all comes with a temptation. Following Christ can lose its true character as a great adventure leading to a high destiny, and it can instead be misinterpreted as just a call to be a good and conventional member of society, simply checking off the boxes. In an apostolic time, the Church's main task is to provide an apostolic witness and to establish a counterculture in which a Christian way of seeing and behaving can take root and act as a leaven upon the wider non-Christian world. This describes the life of the Church during the first three centuries, and it has also always been the Church's mode of operation whenever there have been missionary encounters with non-Christian societies. The great advantage of such a time is that the Christian faith tends to be more pure because it is more costly and the beauty and challenge of the faith stands out more clearly. There are also profound difficulties in such times. It's harder to practice the faith and many turn away out of fear of persecution or in desire for social prestige. The joy and conquering spirit of the gospel may be obscured by the exhaustion of the constant fight giving rise to defeatism, angry isolationism, and overly rigoristic attitudes. Why is this distinction between the two modes of engagement important today? Though we may not feel the tremors, everything has been shifting under our feet. We have been rapidly moving from a Christendom societal situation to an apostolic one. Many in the church continue to operate with a Christendom mentality, which may have worked well in a Christendom time, but is a disastrous strategic mistake in an apostolic time. 
Methods that worked for generations are now likely to fail. And so it's crucial to adjust the ways we see the world, order our institutions, and arrange our common life. 2,000 years ago, 11 apostles were sent to win the entire world for Christ. They had only a few hundred followers and meager resources, and they were without the normal means and institutions by which to develop a Christian culture. The odds were against them, and they had every reason to despair. But instead, equipped with only the promise of Christ and the conquering spirit of the gospel, they accepted their great commission and they overcame the world. They provide for us the bright image of an apostolic mode of engagement. Let's ask how we, both individually and as the church, can make the shift. How can we move from a Christendom mode to an apostolic mode? A lot is riding on the answer. So as we wrap up, I want to take a minute to think about our current age, how we're being invited to engage the world, and probably the, one of the next thing that goes on that timeline is the Pope's call to synodality, which just took place. And it's been pretty controversial if you've been following church dialogues. Um, but one thing I've noticed as I as I poured over the synod documents, um, if you're looking for a quick fix or answers, you're, you're not going to find it in our synod documents. They're, they're not meant, what people came with, it's not meant to fix the church. But what I see very clearly are the wounds and the needs of our church. You all experience that as you're in the world, as you're sending your ch children into the world. Um, and they, from what I hear, they're encountering new battles that we didn't experience as kids um, that are very much unprecedented. Um, so when we provided those listening spaces as a church and people came and they shared their struggles and they shared their challenges, it gave our church leaders a way to look deeply into that. Now what they do with that is up to the Holy Spirit and is up to the magisterium that has guided the church through all imaginable turmoils, periods of trial, external and internal threat. And so as we, as good, mature Christians, we're not afraid to look at the past and look at the struggles, um, but we trust that Christ and the Holy Spirit is guiding our church, um, even though there are new needs and new challenges that we're encountering as parents, as Catholics, um, and it might look different um, right now, standing where we are, than even when we were kids. Um, so there's still hope there's still ways we can lift each other up to share that message in the world, uh, but we have to be realistic and pragmatic and know that the ground has shifted. We are facing new challenges. There are wounds and needs in the world that need tending to. Um, we can't completely rely on the institutions to do that. Um, you, out in the world, in your workplace, in your schools, with your kids, are, the, are best positioned to bring Christ's message, to bring the healing words of Christ to the world as it is. Um, so in this church, as we've been shifting things to a parent-centered catechesis and really focusing on what it means to live as a missionary discipleship, the stakes are only getting higher. Um, and we hope that you keep coming back in to get fed so you can go out and face those battles of the world. And remember that if you take a lens of eternity, I mean, the church has survived a lot. She'll keep going. Um, if you're interested in some more resources, um, I have some book recommendations. I'm happy to send this, um, this presentation if you're interested. Um, Prime Matters is a project by, by the University of Mary that has articles and videos on how to live the Christian faith in the world. Um, it covers a lot of different disciplines, so medical, um, education, um, business. So there's a lot of great videos. I highly recommend it. There's also a wonderful podcast series um, on salvation history that covers the Christian mythic narrative, um, and you can find that on Prime Matters. Um, there's also a great book th uh, that came out fairly recently by John Vidmar. It's called The Catholic Church Through the Ages. He uses Christopher Dawson's framework and then kind of builds upon it. So I, if you enjoyed this and want to dig in deeper, I recommend this book. It's really enjoyable. It's a quick page turner of a read. Um, so I wrapped up a
little early. <laughs> I was trying to get through that really fast. Um, do we have any questions? All right. Well, and y'all are free to go a little bit early then. Oh, go ahead. You know, I think that's up for debate. I think it's good to be aware of these two frameworks. There's lots of people arguing that we are in an apostolic age. It also might be region dependent. So the apostolic mode of operation has always been the appropriate mode when you're encountering new people. When the church is evangelizing and spreading well, they're taking in the culture, the language, they're honoring that. I mean, we could look back in periods of the history where it wasn't done well, but that's the, how that should be done. Um, it'll vary by time and place. Um, you know, there's, there's times, and I felt like this is very much an apostolic age here, but I'll talk to one of someone who I know who's living in another part of the world where nuns are getting kidnapped and killed, and I'm like, oh, we're not there yet. So it, it just depends. I leave that to you. Um, but it's something definitely to think about and pray about. That was a good question. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you all for being a patient audience. <laughs> and you guys have a couple of extra minutes before you pick up your kids. <laughs>